Let's go through model creation using Keras part. So this part of the activity covers uh, six steps. Please do not mix those six particular steps with the five step, five generic steps of mentioned in previous part. So those six steps are related only to the model creation in Keras. So what should we do? We should gather the data, collect the data to build the learning data set. And today we'll build the model of audio stream classification neural network. So to do that, we'll use public data set. So having the raw audio learning data set, we need to prepare the data. We need to do some digital signal processing. I will explain later on the details. But in general, we need to frame the audio signal. Then the second step of pre-processing, it will be logmal spectrogram. I will also explain the details later on. Then having the ready data set, learning data set, we'll be able to build the model. So uh, this is the fourth step to build the model uh, in Keras li library. Uh, the fifth step is to train the model. So the core activity, in fact, of this part. And then evaluate the model by evaluation. I mean the testing of the model accuracy against new unknown data, so-called test data set. We are building audio stream classification application. So as an input, we have time domain signal. We have just raw audio signal. What can we do? We can transform the time domain signal into frequency domain signal. It means, the frequency domain means, that we will build the spectrograms based on the input time domain raw audio signal. Uh, what is the spectrogram? Spectrogram is uh, just a picture. So, what is the conclusion? We can use the well-known structure of neural network for the picture recognition. It is convolutional neural network to recognize the audio scene. Why? Because we have transformed the audio, the time domain signal, to the picture, to the frequency domain signal. So this is our signal transformation flow, time domain, frequency domain, then a picture as a input data for the neural network, convolutional neural network, and then three classes to be classified, indoor, outdoor, and in vehicle. What about the learning data set? We will use, as I said before, we will use the public data set. It is data set collected by Helsinki University. It is 20 gigabytes of, of raw data composed of uh, 30 seconds long, let's say, atomic recordings. And they have recorded bigger number of audio scenes, acoustic scenes. Uh, they recorded 15 scenes. We need to have in mind that our micro is limited in terms of computational power. So we decided to decrease the number of acoustic scenes down to three classes, indoor, outdoor, in vehicle. And we also decide to decrease the sampling rate from 44.1 kHz down to 16 kHz, decrease the mode of recording from stereo to mono, and decrease the accuracy of the recordings uh, from 30 24 bits integers to single precision floating point. Okay, our tool to build the model, it is the Python source code. The Python is a basic stuff in this case. And I have a general remark. Now, please do not analyze line by line the Python code. It, it doesn't make sense. You can do it later on. My goal, my idea is to show you the, the flow of the development chain. So uh, as a first stop, as a first step to, to build the learning data set, we are downloading the raw audio data set from the public location here. We are doing it using Python code. As the output, as the result of this download process, we have 1170 30 seconds long segments as a development samples, and we have 390 30 seconds long segments of the evaluation samples. A lot of data. Okay, the data preparation. What should we do now? 
to perform the data preparation, at least the basic, what I would say, the medium data signal processing knowledge is needed. This practice, the, the framing of the signal is well known to the DSP experts. So the first step of the data preparation is to frame the signal. So we need to slice the 30 seconds long atomic recording into overlapping 64 milliseconds long frames. This is the basic frame here, the yellow one, 30 is 64 milliseconds long. Why 64 milliseconds long? It was the arbitrary decision of the DSP expert based on his experience. And here is the second overlapping window. The overlapping ratio is 50%. So the half of the frame overlaps the previous frame. Maybe I will show you the numbers. As you can see here, we have 30 seconds long atomic recording. And we decide to slice this atomic recording into frames 64 milliseconds long. So 30 seconds divided by 0 0.064 second. It is 468. Let's take the integer part of the result only. So we have 468 64 milliseconds long frames. But but the frames overlaps with the ratio of uh, 50%. So we need to multiply uh, this integer part by two because of 50% of overlap ratio. So 468, 468 multiplied by two, it is as a final result, 936 frames. Each frame consists of 1,024 ADC samples. Just to remind you, our sampling frequency is 16 kilohertz. Okay. Goal of the overlapping is to avoid the boundary discontinuity during FFT transformation. So this is another more detailed explanation of the framing. Here we have 32 64 milliseconds long samples. What does it mean? As you know from the previous slide, the frame length that is 64 milliseconds and the overlap ratio is, is 50%. So we have 64 milliseconds divided by 2. The stride is 32 milliseconds long. And again, because of arbitrary decision of the DSP expert, we decide to slice the 30 seconds long atomic recording into one second long parts. So one second is the equivalent of the one picture. Why one second? Because, because we have 32 frames so the stride time is 0 0.032 multiply by 32 it is one second point 0 0.024 so here we have time and the frequency so this is the spectrogram of one second long audio recording in fact to be more precise one second point zero twenty four. So the x axis it is a time, y axis it is the it is the frequency and the color of this FFT spectrogram corresponds to the magnitude of the audio signal. So this is the framing and uh, as a result we can perform FFT. This picture has one disadvantage. The useful signal is only present on the small area of the picture. So let's consider, let's think, how to magnify this area, which for sure increase the accuracy of the neural network in terms of the picture recognition. So just to remind you, we are building audio scene classification and we want to mimic the human perception of the audio scene classification. This is the goal. 
So we need to implement all the human audition system mechanism, biological mechanism. Our perception of the magnitude of the signal, of the audio signal, is logarithmic. But also the reception, our human reception of the, of the pitch of the signal is logarithmic. So we are much better in uh, differentiation between the frequency difference of the lower frequency than between the difference of uh, higher frequency. This chart shows this feature. The equation has been developed by scientists uh, in the laboratory, so this equation is taken from the practice, and this is kind of mathematical approximation of the phenomenon. And here you can see, let's take the frequency difference between 300 Hz and 500 Hz. So our perception of this difference is much better than the perception of the, the same, in fact, uh, difference 200 Hz between 3.2 kHz and 3.4 kHz. And we can reuse this relation, this chart, as a kind of magnifier glass to magnify this area on the picture. We can approximate the curve, but by set of filters, triangle sh shape, and we so-called this set of filters, the Mel filter bank. So one filter here, the second filter here, etc., just to approximate this curve. So again, we have row signal, then we are framing the signal to perform the good quality uh, FFT to avoid the frames bond boundary discontinuity problems. Then we have male filter bank taken to approximate the logarithmic characteristic of the pitch perception. Then we can present the result in logarithmic scale. And as a result, we have quite nice picture. So this is the this picture corresponds to this area and consists of much more useful information than the row FFT. So uh, as a result, we have set of 1.024 second long pictures and this is the Python code to prepare those pictures. So just to remind you, we have a set of recordings, 30 seconds long atomic recordings and each of the 30 second long raw audio recording is transformed to the frequency domain and as a result of this transformation we have 29 pictures. So the 30 seconds long atomic recording is represented as 29 spectrograms. Why 29? Each spectrogram covers 1.024 second long recording. So we need to divide the atomic recording, 30 seconds long, by 1.024 so as a result we have 29 of, of course we need to take only the integer part so we have 29 pictures and as final result of this pre-processing code we have 33k almost 34k pictures of the 30 to 32 pixels resolutions okay the next step is uh, after the preparation of the input of the learning data set is quite technical because the picture it is the input to our neural network but we know what this picture represents for example this picture this particular picture represents the outdoor audio scene so this is our grand true data let's say picture number n represents the class number m. We have three classes starting and we can uh, assign to each class the, the number starting from zero. So let's say zero means indoor, one means outdoor, two means in vehicle. 
And because we have a lot of pictures, let's consider the development data set 34K of pictures. This is our input data and we have output data, expected result of the neural network run. So this is the vector. So we have 34K items vector log. And the technical, because Keras expects us to provide the binary matrix instead of a vector, we need to transform the vector to the matrix. So this is technical operation. The next technical step is to standardization. This is the mathematical operation. The goal is to remove the mean and scale the input data variance to the to the unit variance. Why? Because we want to avoid the saturation during MCU data processing. So the standardizing of the data. Okay, this slide is important to catch the generic idea of the neural network and the learning data set. So to learn the neural network, we need a data set. But as you have seen, for example, on this slide, we have two data sets, development data set, and uh, this data set is bigger, and the evaluation data set or test data set, and this data set size is lower than the development data set. And what is behind? So the general learning data set, the development data set as a subset one, evaluation data set as a subset number two. So the development data set, taking the school example, is the material for the lecture. So we have the lecture, and after the, let's say, the school period, we have the kind of validation test. But what is the main feature of this period test? That the material is known, because the teacher said the pupils that during the test will go through the already learned material. The evaluation data, the subset number two, is used for testing the neural network. And the main feature of the evaluation data set is that this evaluation data set has not been presented to the neural network during the development, during the learning. So the evaluation data set, it is the equivalent of the, the final study exam, final university exam. So the, the questions are or should be not known to the pupil during the final exam. This subset is uh, split into two parts, the test data itself and the partial test. The size of partial test is much lower than the, than the final test because of practical reasons. For example, let's consider the test of the microcontroller of the neural network running on the top of the microcontroller and uh, virtual COM port as a channel to provide input data to, to the neural network. The, the virtual COM port, over the, of course, over the USB channel, the band of the USB is limited. It would be not so much practical to send gigabytes of data using USB. That's why we can define the partial test, let's say few megabytes, several megabytes, and use USB to test the neural network. Okay, it was general explanation, and uh, this slide shows the Python code, which splits the data set into development and test and validation and partial test data sets. So for the training, for the development data set, we have 25k of pictures. For the validation, so just to remind you, the validation means the end of the school period exam is uh, about 80k pictures. The final school exam, the validation of the neural net, uh, the, the evaluation of the neural network data set consists of uh, 11k of pictures and the partial data test uh, sample consists of one, 114 pictures because we will use USB as a communication channel and just to, because of practical reason, we need to limit the amount of data. And what is very nice for Python and Keras, this quite complex operation is done using only one line of source code here. So 
Now we have the pre-processing of data. We prepare the development and evaluation data sets. And now it's time to the, I would say, core activity to build the neural network model. Because in fact, we are recognizing pictures. We will use well-known the structure of the neural network for the picture recognition. It is convolutional ne neural network. And again, you can see the big advantage of, of the Keras library, because we need to use only one line to build or to define each layer of the neural network. As a first line, we, we are defining the type of the model. It will be sequential. It means that we are defining layer by layer of the neural network. So first layer is a convolutional 2D layer. The second layer is a max pooling. Again, convolutional 2D max pooling. Then we need to flatten the data to fit the uh, dense layer. And next point is the definition of the dense layer of the brain of our neural network. And the output layer consists of three elements because we have three classes, indoor, outdoor and in vehicle. This is different representation of the graphical representation of the neural network. This is another representation of the same neural network. This is the representation of the neural network generated by Python script. And here is a basic explanation of convolution layer. Convolution layer is a just kind of digital filter. Very basic one, as you can see on this picture. So let's consider 2D input for the neural network, 2D, uh, the, 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 the 2D matrix uh, with the numbers. And for the convolution filter, we need to define the window of kernel size, in our case kernel size 2 by 2, and stride value or step moving filter step value. So in our case stride value is 1 by 1, so we are moving one field each direction of the matrix. And what is the operation behind? Let's consider this green area. We need to take the input value multiplied by the weight of the corresponding ne neuron input, so 8 multiplied by 0 0.5, 10 multiplied by 0 0.1, 3 multiplied by 0 0.2, 15 multiplied by 0 0.8, then sum accumulate all the values and as a result we have 17.6. Here is another representation, this is I would say analog representation of the operation, here is a more digital representation. Just to simplify the picture I assume that uh, all the weights are the same and equal to 0 0.5. So as a result we decrease the amount of data. This is, in fact, the main goal, the main feature of the convolution uh, layer filter to decrease the amount of data. The max pooling layer, the explanation is, the, is similar. The idea is even more simple. So we, again, we have moving window of stride value and we need to just find the maximum value within the moving window. So for example, for this window we have 15, for the magenta one we have uh, 9, for the green one we have, we have 8. And again, the amount of data is decreased. And for example, this filter is very good to, to detect the edges of some shape. And the fully connected layer, the dense layer, here it is the brain of the neural network. Okay, the training process. So having the learning data set, having the neural network structure, we can start the training process. And again, this is only the one line using Keras and Python. Before, we need to select the optimizer and uh, compile the model. As a result, we are getting the, the loss function. So I think uh, I should explain the loss function, which uh, shows us the, the quality the learning process. Of course, the lower losses, the, 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 the better result of the, of the neural network learning process. We need to back uh, to the school, at least for a minute. And the basic idea behind the loss function, it is a gradient. What is a gradient? gradient 
points to the direction of the fastest function increase. So using the gradient, we can find the maximum of the function. But just to be more clear, gradient doesn't point to the maximum of the function. Gradient points the direction to the maximum of the function. So let's consider the very simple free variables function like here. And the gradient of this function, it is a set of the unit derivatives of the function. So df by dx, df by dy, df by dz. Let's evaluate the partial derivatives. So df by dx of 2 multiplied by x, it is 2. df by dy, it is 2, 2y. df by dz, it is 3, z power of 2. And let's consider the starting point coordinates to find the maximum of the function. Let's assume that we start from the coordinates x, y, x uh, equal 1, y equal 2, z equal 3. So this is our starting point in the 3D space. So we can plug into our current, uh, plug in current coordinates into the gradient. So we plug the, the current coordinates into the gradient. You can see here and evaluate the point, the, another point in the space, 2, 4, 27. So the maximum of the function starting from this point in the space, for this space, is in this direction. So we need to draw the line between the starting point and the end point, and this is the direction. Again, to rem just to highlight, this is not the point of the maximum of the function. This is the direction of the maximum of the function. And now the really basic question is, how long should we go in this direction to find the maximum of the function? We can go the small step and then evaluate the next direction using the gradient again. We can go the medium step and evaluate the, the gradient, the direction again. We can go the big step and evaluate the direction. Why it is so important? Because we can just overlook the maximum of the function. So it was the gradient explanation, and now let's come back to the loss function. So what is loss function? Loss function maps the values of one or more variables. In our case, it will be neural network weights and biases. So really a lot of variables, sometimes billions of variables, onto a real number, one real number, which represents some cost associated with those values. And our goal is to minimize the loss function. So on the previous slide, we have discussed the very simple function of free variables. In our case, we have function, neural network weights and biases. It could be even billions of variables. So the really demanding in terms of the computation power. Okay. So the gradient points the direction of the fastest function increase. So can be used to find the maximum of the function. What about the minimum of the function? We need to use the negative of the gradient, the gradient descent approach to find the minimum of the function. So exactly negative approach of this basic rule. So we should go not in this direction to find the maximum, we should go to the opposite direction to find the minimum of the function. And again, the absolutely the basic question is about the step when trying to find the minimum of the function. Because if the step is too big, for the big step of the gradient state, it is possible that we will never converge. For the small gradient descent step, for sure we will, we will converge, we will find the minimum, but the time needed for the computation will be really huge, like days or weeks. Okay, how to evaluate the model, how to build the metric of the model? So the, I would say, most intuitive one metric is the accuracy 
and the accuracy represents the ratio between the what about uh, evaluation uh, of the model metrics the most basic one metrics is uh, just accuracy you can see here the the example 0 0.89 what does it mean it means that for 89 percent of inferences the result was proper so 11 percent of the queries to the neural network the for 11 percent of the queries to the neural network the result of the inference was bad the test loss uh, represents the error during the learning process the quality in fact the quality of the learning process and the lower test loss is the better quality of the neural network learning and in fact the better accuracy the test accuracy is quite a generic number it is kind of overview of uh, neural network behavior and we cannot see the class-wise errors but there is another matrix so-called confusion matrix and for uh, this matrix we can see the quality of the accuracy of the neural network class-wise so as you remember we have three classes to classify indoor outdoor and in vehicle and uh, the size of the matrix you can see here is three by three so because of the number of classes so here you can see that for class zero it is the indoor class the neural network inference results is 0 0.99 it means that if the neural network was fitted the, the picture represents the indoor spectrogram uh, for 99 percent of the cases the inference result was proper for one percent of the cases neural network mixed the indoor class with in vehicle class the same for the outdoor class so 98 percent proper inferences the neural network mixed the outdoor with indoor class for one percent and mixed in vehicle with outdoor class for one percent and for in vehicle for 100 percent the result was okay so this accuracy is here is a little bit different than the overall accuracy here because it is just a mean of the diagonal of the matrix here so it is 0 0.99 how the uh, how it is uh, done with uh, xcube ai the confusion matrix evaluation process so uh, we have uh, custom data for example in a csv file then we fit the generated c model with those custom data then we have expected output grant true so we know what we should expect and there is a dedicated python script to evaluate process the confusion matrix i mentioned here the csv file so it is a more technical slide showing that using python code we can generate all the data sets both the input data set as output data set in csv format using python script